Welcome back to the Oscar Real Movie Podcast. Uh, before we get into it, just wanted to give a quick warning that for whatever reason, my mic was freaking out during the first part of this episode. So through the what we've been watching, reading, and trailer park, it's a little echoey. So if you wanted to skip ahead to the breakdown uh, where the audio clears up, please do so. Just wanted to give you that fair warning up front. Uh, now for the ad read. Are you constantly getting laughed at by prostitutes because of your small penis? Turning to violence will only get you in trouble. Instead, we have the perfect product for you. Instead of resorting to violence, turn to the Swedish-made penis enlarger pump, endorsed by many, including the one and only Austin Danger Powers. This is the sort of thing ain't my bag, baby. One book, Swedish-made penis enlarger pumps, and me. This sort of thing is my bag, baby. By Austin Powers. Ah. There you have it. If it worked for Danger Powers, then it will work for you. Avoid being hunted down by two old bounty hunters and their blind friend. Instead, get the Swedish-made penis enlarger pump and have a good time instead of a bad one. Alright, now on with the show. Lights. Camera. Action. <laughs> The winner is... Welcome back to the Oscar Real Movie Podcast with Healy and Matthew Schmidt. Welcome to episode number 20 of our Best Picture Breakdowns. Yep, yep. The big 2-0, almost legally allowed to drink. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yep, time. Uh, it's been a little while since we've done one, but... I mean, we've done some of the, the shorter, shorter ones in between, between but it feels, feels like we should be further along almost, it feels like, like been doing this since Yeah, I know. We, we're a little behind. Yeah. But that's okay. Yep. Uh, let's see, today we've got 1992's Unforgiven uh, up for breakdown, and we'll discuss uh, that year at the Oscars, and uh, I think what we're going to start doing moving forward is just kind of do a real justice every episode, so we'll talk about the what we... Ooh, we're going to do one each episode, huh? Yeah. All right. Um, I thought maybe, maybe I, forgot I forgot to discuss, to discuss it, with it with you. So breaking, you did not mention that part. No. Breaking news for Haley Schmidt <laughs> live on the podcast. Uh, yeah, I figured that, that's what I really like talking about. Uh, we're, we're still going to do new reviews. Those will be like the 20, 20. That, that, that's just your way to get me to watch more movies. Yeah. Yep. That's been my master plan the entire time. You finally got me 12 years in the works. Yeah. Did it work? Is it working? Mm, I don't know. Okay. Um, <laughs> time will tell. You got me. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, we'll still do newer reviews or streaming reviews. Those will just be the individual like 15 to 20 minute episodes. And then the main one will just be about the best picture winner in that year in the Oscars. And we'll do a real justice against uh, like what should have won or second place. I found a website that gave all the odds for what, they, what the winner would have been for best picture. So we'll just look at like second place or... I'll just call an audible and pick one that I think is maybe even better than the second place one. So we'll just, we'll do that every episode. And so, yeah, we'll see how it goes. Sounds good. All right. First up, we've, we've been in our house for like two years now. It feels like two years. What have you been watching, reading, or <laughs> doing to keep yourself sane in these times? That's so sad. I haven't been reading anything at all. Like, not, like, book publications. Like, I've been reading stuff online and whatever, but it's been bad that stuff I have on your phone. I know. Reading Twitter. I know. I haven't been picking up a book, which kind of makes me sad. Um, but our libraries are opening back up again later this week, so that'll be good. Yeah. Um... But yeah, I mean, we've been, oh my gosh, watching so much stuff, so I don't need to go through everything that we've been watching, but I'll go through some highlights. 
Um, I watched this when it first came out. I feel like it's been very under the radar, very quiet, but there's a short, like, four-episode um, series called Self-Made, inspired by the life of Madam C.J. Walker, and Octavia Spencer plays Madam C.J. Walker, whose real name is, like, Sarah Breedlove, but her, her husband's name at the time was C.J. Walker, so that's kind of how she got her name, um, but she's, like, the, uh, she's America's, like, first self-made millionaire, and um, she's a Black woman who, like, developed and sold this, like, hair care products, and so just, like, her, like, starting out, like, she's pretty poor and stuff and how she became just like this ruthless businesswoman so it, it was cool it was like i said was octavia spencer played her tiffany haddish is in it blair underwood um it's not like it's not gonna blow you out of the water but um i think it's something that people haven't really heard of or seen of so mm-hmm. i want to give a little plug to that one yeah and i i didn't watch that with you and no. i was so the products that she sells is it for african americans yeah right yeah because like, uh that was i mean that was the target market anyway okay because yeah. uh i mean i only know this from stuff like this is us like uh kevin's character dated like you know an african-american woman she admitted that she has to have a special pillow for her hair like so is that like treatment like that right like is it like because do they have to treat their hair in a different way yeah it started as like um she had bought this product um it was like a hair growing like product like put in your hair kind of thing oh. it was um and then she developed her own like, like roguing like grow your hair. <laughs> it's you know it's one of those things where it's like they called it a hair grower but really i think it was just like something that just like helps their scalp and so oh, okay <laughs> like it, it's yeah it's not a like medication type thing but it had like sulfur and weird stuff but um but actually it was kind of fun because like in the very first episode like she's got all these bald patches and stuff and by the end like she just keeps saying she's like come on grow my hair out to like my waist and so she's like her hair just keeps getting longer and more and more luxurious the entire episode but um it was cool i mean she was i read i mean it is like it's it says inspired by the life of like a lot of this stuff like some of the characters in the show were like made up or they were like conglomerates of like actual people in her life so you know take some of the stuff with a grain of salt but uh, i mean a lot of it was true like she did she she developed this product after like using a similar one on herself and she built her company from the ground up and she's she gave away so much of her wealth um she was really cool when she died in new york she was neighbors with john d rockefeller like that was always her dream she's like i want to be the rockefeller like of the black community of the women in this mm-hmm. com- in this world so um yeah it was just kind of it was one of those things where i'm like i know that name but i don't really remember what she did or why she's famous so um yeah so it was kind of cool so i just want to get a little plug for that um you know i also watched the first season of australian survivor yep not cool. yeah not season two of the u.s survivor but like it's yeah. Australian production <clears throat> of Survivor, and it was awesome. It was cool. They did a lot of stuff, like, similar to U.S., but they had a lot of cool new twists. They play for 55 days, which is yeah. just longer than U.S. Survivor. Um, so, yeah, it was just really, really entertaining. So, that was fun to get through that. What you, like... Well... 55 days is just insane to me. <laughs> like, we haven't been in quarantine for 55 days. Not even yeah. close. Yeah, that's just, you know, they they just, they do 39 days in the U.S. survivor, and I think that's a, a long time. Yeah, yeah. I can't imagine being on an island, eating nothing but rice and beans, <clears throat> sleeping outside in a bamboo tent, yeah, how long, how long would you, you make it out there? <laughs> I would be impressed with myself if I made it a week. <laughs> <laughs> I think if I could make it past a week, then I would, like, I, I would feel better about my chances, but I would have to imagine that first week would probably just be, like, total shock to your system. And then you probably reach a groove, and I would say probably, like, that last, like, week, 10 days is probably just, like, hell again, where you're just, like, this needs to be done. <laughs> That's my guess. I don't know. Nice. Um, another cool thing, the last 
two weeks, three weeks, I guess it's been three weeks. Um, NBCSN, well, the NBC Sports Network, I think. Sure. I don't know. We'll I just go with that. NBCSN, I just rolled off the tongue. They have been having Olympic highlights and replays each night. And so this week they had Beijing highlights. The week before they had London. The week before that they had Rio. So it was so cool reliving some of those summer Yeah, Olympic you're moments. going through Olympic withdrawals. Cause I'm so sad. I love the Olympics so much. You love the Olympics more than I think you love me sometimes. Sometimes, sure. Yeah. No, 100%. You get so excited for the Olympics. What what what's the line? How to lose a guy in ten days? I may love you, Benny, but I don't have to like you right now. <laughs> there you go. Great. Our <laughs> life is the romantic comedy. Hey, at least that's a good one. Um, but yeah, so it's been super fun watching um, old Olympic highlights, and it's. I mean, some of the stories like you know you remember like you remember Michael Phelps winning eight golds in. Beijing, which is really cool, was like you don't remember some of the races from London and just like um, watching stuff in Beijing last night, like the women's gymnastics, like scoring was super controversial. I'm like, God, I do not remember that at all. Like, so it's been fun. Nice. So those are things I wanted to share. That's what you got on your list. Okay. Yeah. Um, for me, for what I've been reading, the only thing I've been reading is comics. Mm-hmm. So, so I, I read Once in the Future, which is by Boom Comics, and uh, I got, you know, uh, that one came to my attention because a podcast I listened to, uh, it's the Comic Pop People, uh, or, you know, group, their, their podcast called the Elseworld Exchange, but they talked about that comic a little bit, and that was really good. Um, it's about, like, kind of it's like a fantasy adventure it's modern it takes place modern day but it's about king arthur coming back to life and he actually isn't a good person and this grandma who used to be like a monster hunter comes out of retirement to like fight him off and she drags along her grandson so it's a lot of medieval lore mixed in with like adventure and stuff like that so it was really good it's ongoing, but comics in general are not ongoing right now. <laughs> they're, they're like they're not being printed right now. Right? They're not being printed for a while. The big two, DC and Marvel, were still releasing their stuff digitally, their new stuff. But then they stopped doing that to like quote unquote support comic book stores. So we'll see how long that lasts. Yeah. Um, but my I do have the Marvel Unlimited app, which uh, you can just read all Marvel comics on it. It's about two months. More, maybe more than that, behind on new stuff. Uh, so I was reading the new Daredevil run by Chip Zdarsky on that because it's supposed to be really good and it has been really good, but I'm all caught up on that now, so I need to find something else to read. Uh, the stuff that I've been watching, watch John Wick 3, finally, finally watched that. It's on HBO. That was pretty good. Uh, Masters Weekend was a couple weekends ago, so I probably watched. Oh my gosh, we watched so like many. Four or five different final rounds throughout yeah, the whole weekend, if not more. Different years. The 2019 Tiger, last year Tigers win. Oh, four, Phil's first win. Yeah, we watched, watched a bunch. I was sad. I was wearing my like Masters quarter zip, <laughs> just wanting to be outside and playing. And yeah. So yeah. And yeah, then, wait till November now. Yep. For the Masters, yeah. We'll see how that goes. Do well, you think it'll be green, like green, no. green there? No. No? No. You know, like they'll whip out all the spray cans nah, and paint maybe. it green? Or they're going to embrace... But it's like all, all the flowers and stuff they have, like they've got certain like species of flowers that will like bloom at the right time, you know? So it's like by the time we get to November, like none of that's going to be around. You don't think they're going to just ship in stuff that's blooming? I mean, they play for fake bird sounds, so they probably will just bring in fake plants to make it look Fake better. or like, I don't know, there's some part of the world tucked away in a corner where uh zaleys are blooming in november they're gonna ship them in they got the money that's very true uh and then recently i downloaded uh all the episodes of the batman animated series so i'm probably gonna start re-watching those and i watch i'm watching the sopranos 
So yeah, there's my my list of things. That, <laughs> a lot of things to watch. Yeah, it was there, like in the middle of a bunch of stuff. We started watching McMillions this week, oh, yeah. which has been really fascinating. Yep. Um, just so weird. Like you don't realize. Like that's so out of my realm of like comprehension that there are people who are like, yeah, we'll just steal McDonald's game pieces and like give them to our friends and shit and like sell it to them. I'm like, what? There are people who do this, who did this. Mm-hmm. And those are not even the worst people in the world. <laughs> I'm just like, oh, that is so, like, outside of my bubble. <laughs> yes, very much so. <laughs> so it's just, it's, oh my gosh, there are some characters, like, Tiger King has some characters. This has, like, their own level of characters, too. Mm-hmm. Very, very strange. Anyway. Yep. Do we have one episode left on that or two? We got two left. Yeah. So... We'll probably finish that this weekend. Mm-hmm. Cool. Anything else before we get into the trailers this week? Nope. All right. Why don't you kick us off with the first one? All right. So first trailer in the trailer part today is uh, the new Tom Hardy movie, Capo- uh, Capone, not Capote. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I definitely didn't say that <laughs> earlier when I when we watched it for the and first time. Like, Capote? No, this looks like Al Capone. <laughs> we look at the tail. Oh, yeah. No, Capone. Cool. I just said the wrong name. You I did. knew it was Capone, yeah. but I said the wrong name. <laughs> Capone. Capone. Starring uh, Tom Hardy. This was like the first te- teaser. It was like a minute and a half long. Uh, recently, the news came out. This won't be in theaters. It's going straight to streaming. Oh, really? Yeah. When? I don't know. come out? I don't know. It's going to be VOD, so it's going to be like pay for it. Yeah. You know, it isn't going to be like, oh, it's on Hulu now. It's going to be like, you got to pay 20 bucks, I assume, to see it. So uh, Capone is so it's about after he got arrested and spent like 10, 11 years in jail. It's about his time after getting out of jail when he starts going crazy. And it's like the leading up to his death. So what did you think of the trailer for Capone? Um, I guess, I mean, maybe part of it is just the makeup whatever but was Al Capone really that nasty looking like the Tom like Tom Hardy looks like he's got scars all over his face he's got bumps all over his face like there's a scene where like his eyes are all red and bloodshot I'm like this looks more like a horror movie than like a real person so it was very off-putting I would say like the younger version of Capone where he's like in his like zoot suit kind of thing with cigar in his mouth i'm like okay like that looks like the al capone and like the pictures that we've seen but when he's like the older going crazy i'm like he just looks like i don't know like someone from a monster movie it just looks weird it looks very weird yeah i uh i give i don't think this looks, looks good unfortunately <laughs> i like tom hardy uh, Linda Cardellini is in it as well. Um, she wasn't in the trailer, but she's on the cast list for IMDb. I just don't think it looks that good, though. Uh, I can't really put my finger on why, other than I watched that trailer. I just went, nothing in this really seemed interesting to me. I would agree. Um, I feel bad saying that because I, I, I'm probably go, I'm going to sit here and say, I want to see him when he's like, a gangster and yeah. you know like in his prime but we we probably get a lot of that we've seen it in the untouchables i mean i know that's an older movie and capone was like the focal point of that or or robert de niro wasn't the lead in that uh but i still would rather see him like in the prime i think that's what most people would want to see but like i get that this is a different take and this is like a side of the story that not a lot of people know about but i just didn't think the trailer looked good I really didn't get looked good. It wasn't very compelling. And like I said, like, he was just, I don't know, he just didn't look right. <laughs> I don't know. It was just weird. Yeah. yeah. And unfortunately, like, I hope it's good. Obviously, I just like good movies, but because of who the writer-director is, the writer-director is Josh Trank. And let me see if it was the last movie he directed, but if that name sounds familiar to people out there, it is because he was the writer-director 
for Fantastic Four Stick from 2015. Because, you know, they made one of the A's the number four because that was really cool, I guess, mm-hmm. back then. So, yeah, he wrote and directed the Fantastic Four movie from Which was a 20, yeah, 2015 yeah. with Miles Teller and Michael B. Jordan. And, yeah, like, you're right. It was a disaster. We were kind of excited to see it when the trailer so came out. Because I like the cast. Yeah, I heard how terrible it was. I'm like, mm, maybe we'll just wait until it comes out later and then we just never watch yeah, it. Yeah, it's, 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 it's funny, funny we brought that up because uh, we watched uh you know i, li- I listened to the weekly planet podcast mr sunday movies and he did like a 15 minute like they watched that movie and then talked about how trashy it was so that was nice to bring up some memories and this is the first movie josh trank has written and, and directed, directed since fantastic four so, so it's, it's one of those things, things where like and he's pretty, pretty open about like he didn't think like he thought he had a good movie there and then the studio can't came in and cut his movie up it was originally supposed to be like over two hours long and the final product was an hour and a half and it was just terrible uh so it was one of those things where like you hope he gets back on his feet and puts a like a good movie out there so it's five years later and this is the first thing he's written and directed since that and i feel bad saying it but capone just doesn't doesn't look look good to me i hope i'm wrong for his sake and just and like tom hardy's and everyone's too because I just hope this is a good movie, but it just didn't look compelling to me. Yeah. I'm, it's, it's not high on my list, I guess. Yeah. We'll see how much it is, I guess, to watch it. Yeah. Um, all right. Well, I guess let's go to, there's not a lot of trailers out there, but Trolls World Tour. So the sequel to the first Trolls movie, which the only thing I can tell you about the first Trolls movie is uh, the song that came out with <laughs> Justin Timberlake. Yep, yep. Um, so, I don't know. I mean, this is clearly made for kids, not really for us, but I don't know any interest in Trolls World Tour. Seems to have, like, an infinity gauntlet idea to it because there's six different strings that they have to hunt down the six different types of music. Yeah um yeah it's i mean yeah i didn't see the first one i i mean yeah it's it's a kids movie it's not but not on the level of like pixar where it's like oh like this is gonna be really good and adults will enjoy it too like trolls is 100 percent like something for the kids to watch so not on my list yeah it's kind of interesting they're bringing in different types of music like that's kind of a cool idea Mm -hmm. I just hope it's done well and it isn't like stereotypical <laughs> versions of each of those kinds of music. Which right. it kind of well, seems like it might be. I was gonna say my um like biggest introduction to this movie is the fact that Kelly Clarkson, who like voices one of the characters in this, she was a guest on Top Chef a couple weeks ago and talked about the movie. Oh, yeah. And that's probably where I know most of the movie from is from Kelly Clarkson talking about on Top Chef, which is so so lame but yeah she's like oh it's about like inclusion and everyone having their own voice like oh that sounds nice like that sounds like a nice message you know so (laughs) i hope that that comes across but eh, it's not something i need to watch no no no, i think when i i think when it came out like two three weeks ago wasn't there a big like oh like trolls watch party kind of thing and like they try to get like everyone to like watch it together on the same night or something Mm. so i don't know i don't know how that turned out but we don't we don't have a lot of friends with young kids and stuff that are into this so no idea no, not not the not. age for this nope. no bunch of newborns out there yeah um but yeah i mean i i agree like they, they've got a great cast like in terms of like musicians and stuff like i said kelly clarkson uh is in it justin timberlake mary j blige voice is one of the yeah. characters I'm like oh that's kind of cool like, like, so if the songs are good i can watch it because mm-hmm. like i mean music is a huge part of it so if They've got great talent like that, and the music is good. It's probably watchable for me, but if the music isn't it that good, there probably isn't much else for me to sit through. One thing that was weird, so, like, two of the songs that they had in the trailer that were both used, like, kind of as, like, half jokes. One was Spice Girls Wannabe, and the other one was Who Let the Dogs Out, and I'm like, like, who, like, kids are not going to understand those. They don't know those songs. Yeah. Like, four or five-year-olds are not going to know those. And I feel like, I like parents with lie. them, you know, I'm just like, I feel, I'm like, who are these jokes for? Like, I feel like that, 
I don't know which audience that's going to, but whatever. It just seemed weird. I was like, is anyone still laughing at who let the dogs out? Like, I think we're past how that. Much, how much did the first Trolls movie make? I feel like it did pretty well. Like, animated ones usually do well, I guess. But just for the, you know, it's for kids, more people would go see it. It's a 6.5 on IMDb. Um, because it's just, like, who wanted a Trolls movie? Because, like, we had those dolls. Like, yeah, I mean, if the first one makes enough money, I guess it's worth it. But I was just wondering, like, like, I just remember those dolls growing up as a kid, and I thought they were really creepy, so I just didn't... Yeah, I was never a big Trolls fan. Yeah, so it was... I was surprised that they were making a movie in general, and a sequel, I guess, as well, but... If the first one made enough money, then I guess they're just going to do a sequel anyways. I mean, right. Scooby-Doo got a sequel back in the day, too. Yeah, so the budget was $125 million and made $347 million. There you go. Okay, yeah. I guess I see why they're making a sequel to it. It makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Okay. Uh, last trailer is a Netflix film, which I'll have to look up the release date. I think it's coming out soon, but it's April 24th. Extraction, starring uh, Chris, Chris Hemsworth. Hemsworth. It's uh, kind of a mix, like a Jason Bourne-ish type movie. So he plays, I don't know what part of the military he's in. I'll have to look it up maybe a little bit. But he's like a black Man, officer. I, I, on IMDb, it said like, uh what was the word they used but he's like a mercenary like i don't think he's even like okay, yeah, like not in the military not active military he's, he's trained though but he definitely has some skills yeah so yeah he's uh paid or hired to extract uh this kid uh from i think he was kidnapped like this kid was kidnapped because yep. yep. he's the son of a drug lord and there's like this drug uh war going on between these two head honchos and this kid is like the son of one of them so it, Hemsworth is paid to go in and get him out of the situation. And uh, so, yeah, that's, and they kind of get caught in the crossfires, like uh, the city that he's caught up in. Uh, kind of, so it's like somewhere in the Middle East, right? Yeah. I feel like they say the country's at the beginning. I don't remember offhand anymore. But anyway. Yeah, so they're, they, the city kind of starts exploding and like metaphorically and probably literally a little bit in tension and everything so he can't get out anymore essentially him and the kid are stuck in the city and he kind of makes a promise to the kid that he's going to get him out so like, the movie's about him trying to get this kid out of the city and that and not safely so yeah what, i mean what did you think of this trailer especially since i mean it's going to be a netflix and yeah, right coming out this friday so it's easy for people to watch yeah it's it looks a little too like intense for my preference. Um, too much out of your little bubble. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, you know, I'm a huge Chris Hemsworth fan. Um, the Russo brothers work on this, so it's like you know they did Avengers, Infinity War, Endgame, and stuff. Mm -hmm. It's like I trust the people involved with it, but I just. I don't know. It's not something like if you have it on, I might sit down and watch it with you, but it's not gonna be something like, hey, let's you and I plan to watch this together at a specific time. I don't think I need it to be that kind of movie. No? No. Okay. I think um I think this movie looks awesome. Like I'm like excited to see this movie. Uh it's you're right, it's kinda in like I think it's in the middle of the seat. Um I feel I feel like part of this is just because like things are just sad and gloomy in like regular life that I don't need like extra depressing shit in my like escape, you know? Yeah, this this seems like it's gonna be up uplifting ish in the sense of like he's trying to help this little kid and keep him alive. Is that a good spin? I mean, that makes it sound better, but I know that's not what it's actually going to be. Uh, but I don't know. I think it looks really cool. David Harbour's in it as well. Yeah, um, that's right. Yep. I don't know. I like, it's kind of a redemption story. It seems like uh, Chris Hemsworth's character probably lost 
a kid or son or something at some point in his life because he seems to really become attached to the, this kid that he's trying to save the life of. Uh, and, and so, so it, it seems, seems like, like kind of a redemption story for him. And plus, it's like, you know, it's a guy who's caught in a shitty situation. He's trying to do the right thing. And because in the trailer, I mean, multiple people, David Harbour, one of them, are telling them, like, just the, the best thing you can do for this kid is put a bullet in his head. Put him out of his misery and just get out of there. Uh, and Chris Hemsworth is like, no, I'm going to get him out of here. I, I promised I would. So it's, you know, redemption arc. Uh, doing the right, you know, thing morally, even though other people are telling you not to. It looks like there's a lot of reaction in it. So I'm actually kind of excited. This is the one I'm most excited to see out of all of these. Uh, so I mean, I'll agree with that. That this is the most, most, most interesting. <laughs> You're saying it like based on the other two are not that good, and I guess I am too, and to an extent saying that too. But like, I think this one actually looks good. So, <laughs> that's just, I don't know, that's, that's how, how I do a lot. I think I'm, I'm, trying, I'm trying, trying to see if, like, any Rotten Tomato scores are out on it right now. Because it comes out Friday. This might be one that we review. Maybe I'll, this will be one of my picks, and I'll just quote-unquote force you to watch it. Maybe not. <laughs> oh. Like I said, it's tough enough making it through a normal day. I don't also need to spend my free time watching people shoot each other in depressing situations. Oh, yeah, all right. Uh, well, it's a 57% on Rotten Tomatoes. Ooh, I mean, I'll say that's, that's lower there than how I'm feeling on it right now. Yeah. I did not expect it to be that low, but who knows? Yep. It's not wide release yet, so. Yep. We'll see what happens there. Okay, let's get into our breakdown for Unforgiven. Like we said, this came out in 1992. It was directed by Clint Eastwood, and it stars uh, stars Clint himself, uh, Morgan Freeman, Gene Hackman, and Richard Harris. Um, it was funny, when we were watching this, we were probably like halfway, three quarters of the way through, I'm like, God, when does Ed Harris show up? I kept thinking it was Ed Harris, and I was like, oh no, wait, it's Richard Harris, and yeah. he was already in this. You're just getting him mixed up with his Westworld character. <laughs> yeah, it, you know, maybe that's part. Of, that's probably part of what it was. Um, anyway, those are your four main uh, stars in this one. It had nine Oscar nominations and won four of them. Uh, won Best Picture, Clint Eastwood won Best Director, Gene Hackman won Supporting Actor, and uh, Joel Cox won for film editing. It was also nominated for Leading Actor, which Clint was nominated for uh, Original Screenplay, which was by, by David Webb Peoples. Um, also nominated for Cinematography, Set Decoration, and Best Sound. Yeah, I think it led or tied for the lead in most nominations of that year at the Oscars. Okay. With nine. So... I say that's usually a pretty good showing for, mm -hmm. you know, any given year, I guess. Yeah, yeah, no, definitely very good. And uh, so, yeah, like you said, one best picture. This is one of only three Westerns uh, considered, quote, Westerns to win best picture. First being Cimarron way back in the 30s or something like that. Uh, it's kind of a racist movie, so I'm not a fan of that Yeah, one. <laughs> I saw part of that with you. Like, wasn't yeah. it on, like you recorded on TCM or something? Yeah, I'd never seen it. And yeah, I'll never see. Little... I'll never yeah, see it nope, again. Nope, you unless, don't really need to see that. Unless we rewatch it for this podcast. I'm dedicated to this podcast, <laughs> so I will watch that racist movie for you viewers. Um, and then Dances... And then you can tear it apart. <laughs> yes. And then Dances with Wolves won in 1990, so just two years prior to this. Uh, I don't really consider either of those movies westerns, though. Uh, when I think western, I think, uh, you know, the classic, uh, we got a sheriff, an outlaw, the gunslingers, uh, you know, you have a saloon with the French swinging doors, mm -hmm. uh, stuff like that. Um, those other two are kind of, they take place on the western frontier, so that's probably why they're classified that way. But this is really the only true western, I would consider true western to... To win Best Picture, you got some neo-westerns out there, like No Country for Old Men, which won Best Picture, uh, but yeah, this is this is the only one I really consider a true western to win. Uh, this uh, Clint uh, 
kind of, uh, he wanted to make a, not a deconstruction of a Western, but a different take on a Western. He'd been wanting to make this movie for years, actually. He actually waited like six or eight years to make this movie because he wanted to be older Hmm, to make it okay because the, so like was the screenplay like already out there written? yeah this, like there or like at least the story idea was kind of out there already. yeah this screenplay i actually have some uh interesting like tidbits here um this screenplay had actually been around since 1976 oh my god uh yeah no right david uh, webb peoples was a film editor in the 70s writing scripts on the side and uh his first big break came when he was hired to co-write Blade Runner for Ridley Scott, which came out in like 81, 82, something like that. Uh, So yeah, he actually, he wrote this movie kind of during that, you know, in the 70s time frame. Uh, And Francis Ford Coppola almost made it. It was, you know, it was kind of kicked around for a while. And then uh, uh, Clint Eastwood got his hands on it and he actually wanted to be older to make it. So he actually sat on making it for like six years or something like that because this is a different kind of Western where the the main character is older, right? Like, um, Mm -hmm. I guess just to dive right into like what happens in this movie. Uh, So it opens with a bang. Do you get it? Do you get my joke there? Yeah. Because people are having sex in the beginning. (laughs) I didn't even realize that's when that was. So, what was going on? So it opens with a oh, bang. Oh, no, 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 Yeah. No, I thought, no, it starts with, like, the text. No, oh, it doesn't count. Okay. All right. It doesn't, it doesn't count in Star, Star Wars. Star Wars, then. I knew you were going to say that, and I immediately regret it. I'm trying to make a joke here. <laughs> Completely fell on my face. It went over my head. I'm sorry. That's okay. <laughs> so this movie technically opens <laughs> with a crawl. Uh, not unlike Star Wars, where it actually originally it was supposed to be a voiceover, but Clint wanted to make it an uh, like a written crawl, where it talks about how this this good looking like girl, like young woman, uh, fell in love with a, a gunslinger William Money, and this woman's uh, or the, yeah this woman's uh, mother was not happy with it, but um, but they were married, and then some years later she died. I can't remember what disease was it. I can't remember what it was. She died of some disease. Um, and it, it kind of opens with that crawl, and in the background it shows Clint Eastwood's, like, silhouette. Smallpox, maybe? Yeah. A lot of people were probably dying of smallpox back then. So we'll go with that. Um, and in the background is, like, a silhouette of Clint uh, burying, like, the grave for his wife. And then it fades to black, uh, black I can talk. And then this movie opens up with a bang. <laughs> yes. Reintroducing that joke. What a callback from just a couple minutes ago that was. Where uh, people are having sex in a brothel. And uh, it's really about two, like these two men are at this brothel. And one of them gets kind of insulted by one of the prostitutes in his mind. And, um, <laughs> yep. What are you laughing at? <laughs> I'm just laughing at the situation. <laughs> she chuckles when she sees this thing. <laughs> his, little, his little wiener. <laughs> yeah. He's a little ding dong. Yep. Uh, and so he gets insulted by that. You know, he's compensating for something clearly and cuts up her face. Uh, and so after that happens, the owner of the brothel, uh, you know, because he kind of views this woman as his property, uh, gets pissed off because now she can't, no one's going to sleep with her because she's all cut up. So he's pissed, calls in the local sheriff, who's a uh, little bill played by Gene Hackman, Oscar winning role for Gene Hackman. He's phenomenal in this role. He's kind of a villain, which yeah. is one of the different yeah. takes that Clint takes in this movie. So he, he wanted to do a different Western because Hollywood had kind of uh, glorified the Western, like, you know, the idea of a Western for a number of years where it's this, happy-go-lucky, oh, the sheriff always wins in the end. The good guy's the sheriff. He always wins in the end. There's a gunfight. They just do a duel, a standoff, whatever. They gets the girl in the end. I mean, think typical John Wayne movies, uh, which I grew up on. I never, my dad loves them. I don't find them enjoyable. I never really loved Westerns, but uh, that's like the glorified version that Hollywood had made for years, and Clint wanted to do something different. So in this, the sheriff is Little Bill. Gene Hackman, you know, he's good at what he does, but he's kind of a terrible person. He's not a good guy. Uh, he shows up uh, to kind of put on his his justice here, and his justice is basically that uh, the two men owe the owner of the brothel some horses by, like, the next season or something like that. He doesn't even, like, use the bullwhip on them 
or anything like that. So the, the madam of the brothel and the rest of the prostitutes are pissed off. So they put a hit out. Uh, they put a bounty out on the two men that did this. Um, which, you know, word starts spreading. It takes place in Wyoming, and uh, Clint's character, William Money, lives in Kansas at this time. And word kind of starts spreading uh, all the way to him to the point where, while he's living on his farm in his old days with his two kids, you know, uh, the nephew of one of his former, like, running mates back when he was, like, a terrible person, outlaw, killing people, finds him to kind of uh, help him go get this bounty. So... Uh, the two of them go off and do that. Uh, William Money, along the way, picks up his old partner, Ned Logan, played by Morgan Freeman. So the three of them run off to go collect on this bounty. Uh, while that's going on, uh, we get introduced to a new character, English Bob, played by not Ed Harris. <laughs> not Ed Harris. But Richard Harris, old Dumbledore himself. Uh, the first Dumbledore. He he gets introduced. R.I.P. Yep, R.I.P. Big R.I.P. We get introduced to him, and he isn't—he isn't an outlaw, but he's not a sheriff either. He's kind of this gun for hire. The railroads have uh, hire him out to, you know, shoot workers who try running away or something along those lines. And he's got a, a story past, like he's kind of a, not a legend, but people know who he is. Uh, and he's kind of coming through town, through the town of Big Whiskey, which is where Little Bill is a sheriff of. And along with him, he's got a writer. Uh, who's basically right? his biographer. He's writing, like, his life story. And uh, they run into Little Bill, and the two of them know each other, Little Bill and English Bob. Um, Little Bill kind of just ends up beating the shit out of him uh, and uh, putting some truth into the stories that English Bob had been telling this writer, and they're, they're not necessarily true. He'd been making up stories to make himself look good, and then Little Bill kind of puts a hole in those. Mm -hmm. uh, and so he leaves town, and right after he leaves town is kind of when William Money and Ned Logan, the Schofield kid, they show up into town. Uh, but it's raining out, and uh, Little Bill has this rule where firearms aren't allowed in town, and they all have firearms, so he beats the crap out of William Money, who's kind of sick at this point. I think it's, like, rain-related. He's like, been in the rain all day long. He's old. Old people get sick. Coronavirus, stay inside, everybody. <laughs> um, so, the the next chunk of this movie is kind of the, him just healing up. You know, he he spends multiple days just trying to get better. Uh, after that happens is when they finally start going after the two men that they were hired to kill. It's really like three quarters of the way through the movie before you start seeing some action in in this, which is another difference between traditional westerns. There's usually a lot of gunfighting, things like that. But in this movie, it takes like three quarters away the to get there. They end up killing the two men. Ned Logan runs off before they start killing the second one because he doesn't really want to do this anymore. He's old, just like William Money, and he's like, I don't, I can't do this anymore. So he leaves. Uh, after they kill the two men, they find out Ned had actually been captured and killed by Little Bill. Because of that, William Money gets all pissed off and does like one, his one last hurrah of being a. Uh, a total badass and he goes into the saloon and just kills everyone including little bill for killing ned um and then rides off not even into the sunset but in the rain middle of the night in the rain rides off uh and then it ends on a crawl just like how it opened on saying that the mother the the wife uh you know the woman that it referenced in the beginning willie money's wife Shows up at the farm to see his her daughter's grave and finds that the house is abandoned. Saying William Money took the two kids and basically left town. And that's how the movie ends. So it's a it's a different take on a western, which is what I like probably like about it. I I really love this movie. Um, you know, it there there's funny moments in it as well because it's so different because <laughs> William Money is so old. I mean, <laughs> The, the first time he tries getting on his horse to, like, start this journey, like, he, he can't even get on the horse. Like, the horse yeah. is freaking out. He's freaking out. He's like, what the hell am I doing kind of thing. Yeah, I even love it when he puts, like, a can on a stump and he yes. tries shooting it yes. with his pistol and he can't hit it. It's, like, eight shots and he doesn't hit it, so he's <laughs> stomper. You know, the kids are looking at him like, whoa, what's wrong with Dad? And he goes into the house, grabs a shotgun, and then blows it off. And he's like, yeah, shotgun still works. We're fine. <laughs> yeah. 
Um, so yeah, what, what did you think of this movie? What are some of the things you liked, disliked, etc.? What did you think of Unforgiven? Yeah, it was, it like you said, there are some good, um, like, moments of comic relief in here, too. Like, it, it, it really doesn't get too serious until uh, towards the end, especially when uh, they end up capturing Ned. But kind of along the way, there are some good moments. Um, <clears throat> like, a funny part for me is when... Uh, Ned and Bill Money and um, Schofield Kid are like on their way to Montana and um, you know like Ned. Wyoming. Oh yeah, yeah, Wyoming. Yeah, they're the same. <laughs> um, uh, it's funny because I said I'm like God, is it Montana? I don't know if that sounds right. So Wyoming, thank you. Um, yeah, when they're like on their way and Ned realizes that Schofield Kid can't see that well yeah so he points up to this guy he's like oh yeah look at that hawk up there blah blah blah. and the kid's like oh yeah mm -hmm, the hawk and he's like no there's nothing up there like how blind are you so yeah this kid's like he can't see very far and that's part of the reason why he's gathered them like he's like i i can't do this myself kind of thing um you know he even mentions like towards the end that that's one of the things he wants to do with some of the money from the bounty is get himself a pair of spectacles so he can see which is kind of funny but yeah just there the interaction between the three of them like when they kind of camp out at night and ned's just like he's kind of over the i i feel like ned gets like the worst treatment here in this like he didn't really intend on going but he's like ah clint can't get up on his horse anymore i'll go with him mm -hmm. and yeah he's laying outside and it's raining he's like hey, i got this kid ask me all these questions like just shut up kind of thing and you know, he, he ends up dying in the end, which was, which was sad. But, um, so yeah, I, I liked some of those kind of goofy moments. Um, you know, even when, so the writer you were talking about, uh, English Bob's like writer, biographer. That dude sucks. His character, Beauchamp. And, uh, that night that he just kind of like ditches English Bob, he's like, oh yeah, little Bill, I'll go back with you to your house that you built and, you know, we can keep sharing stories. And it's like, it's pouring rain, all the, like, water's coming in through the roof, and he's like, God, well, you had a shitty carpenter. Like, you need to have someone else. Build. Yeah, like, that's like a running joke through the movie. Like, all the townspeople are like, little Bill doesn't know how to build a house. Not a straight board on that house. Yeah, exactly. So, like, just little moments like that are kind of funny. Um, but you're right. It's a different take on a Western. Um, you know, it's like two old gunslingers who kind of, like, now let's get back in the saddle and let's do this one last thing. And it's, you know, kind of, you know, trying to, like, avenge this prostitute who got her face cut up. It's like, in what other Western are there men who are like, yeah, let's step up and help this prostitute that was wronged, you know? So that was kind of a a different feel. And plus, um, you know, like, the, the story about Bill is that, yeah, he used to do all these bad things, but then he had, like, a good woman come into his into his life and kind of changed him and just seeing, um, you know, like, just, yeah, how he changed as a person I thought was a really different take than, than you see in a lot of main characters in Westerns. They're usually kind of gritty, tough, non-emotional. Yeah, I think they're usually, like, one note. And what yeah. I like about this movie is that it's got different emotions and what I feel like different layers like it's a deeper western than I think uh most westerns are uh you know it deals with the aging main character which has been done before in like True Grit and The Shootist but it isn't a common thing that happens mm -hmm. uh there really isn't a good guy in this you probably you'd probably consider Clint Eastwood's William Money like the good guy throughout most of the film but like in the end, he was, like, a terrible person in his past life, and he says he's reformed, but by the end of the movie, he kind of has that one last moment of being, like, that terrible person. He's, like, a killing, ruthless, yeah, yeah. and ruthless and killing a bunch of people. Uh, you know, the sheriff is traditionally the good guy in, in Westerns, and in this, I mean, little Bill, his, he probably has right-ish intentions, but he's just ruthless, and he's willing to, you know, beat up and almost kill, well, he does kill Ned Logan, like, innocent people in the crosshairs because ned he didn't kill anyone like he was there when they killed the first guy but like he's like i need to get out of here um yeah but that that Bosham guy sucks we're just getting into some characters some things i didn't love about the movie he's just he's like a guy strutting around like he owns the place just because he's like associated with someone uh and then he just ditches on the first chance he can <laughs> yeah yeah 
uh, and he thinks he thinks he knows everything. He's like, after William Money kills everyone in the bar, he's like talking to him like, oh yeah, you killed Little Bill first because he's the best gunfighter, right? Usually you kill the best one first. William Money's like, I don't know, I got lucky with the order. Mm, yeah. Um, some other things that like, I, while I love this movie, I think I wish would have been different are like two of my favorite characters. I mean, there are three characters that I like in this movie, not because they're good people, but just the portrayal is really good. It's English Bob, Little Bill, and William Money. I mean, they're the three leads. And English Bob and William Money, they have no screen time together. That would have been kind of nice. I don't know how you do it in the script, but it would have been cool if, like, two of the lead characters would have actually met and interacted with each other. Uh, this is a movie where, like, because of everyone's reputation, everyone seems to know each other. So it would have been cool if they would have had some history that would have been brought up or resolved in some way, um, which would have been kind of cool. Uh, also, I don't even know why English Bob was, like, going through town. It seemed kind of random he was doing that. I have no idea why, why that was going on. Um, but, you know, overall, I like, I like all the, the acting in it. The, like, the, how all of them, uh, like, Morgan Freeman, all the leads, the acting job was great. I like Morgan Freeman as, like, that morality check character. He's always, like, you know, he's the one we probably connect with the most as a viewer like should you they be doing this should they not um but yeah my favorite scene is after they kill the second guy it's just the Schofield kid and William Money they're sitting uh, like at on this hill um waiting for one of the prostitutes to come bring them their money and uh Schofield kid had been bragging that he'd killed multiple people like beforehand like while this movie's taking place and he's the one that kills the second uh bounty like the bounty and uh he's having a hard time it's pretty clear pretty clear he'd actually never killed anyone before and he's having a hard time dealing with the fact that he just killed someone which is also something new in in westerns i feel like most time they just you know draw they kill someone and it's like they're considered a hero you don't really see like the emotional stress it de deals with killing someone in westerns and this one it does show that um but you know he's talking to to will to Will and, uh, you know, Clint Eastwood has a, some of the best lines during this conversation where uh, Schofield Kid is like, I can't can't believe I killed someone. Like, I'm never going to do that again. Like, that guy's never going to breathe again. And Clint has the line where he's like, yeah, it's a funny thing killing a man. You take everything he ever was and is ever going to be. And uh, Schofield kid trying to like make it okay in his head. He's like, yeah, but they had it coming. They had it coming. It's okay. And Clint says like, we've all got it coming, kid. So some sweet lines delivered by Clint, mm -hmm. uh, who you know this is a natural role for him. He's been doing westerns forever, so he fell into this role like it was like a glove. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I just I just overall really really enjoyed this movie. Um, generally speaking, this is a very, I mean, a one best picture, but it's just highly regarded, uh, anyways, I know when the AFI, the American Film Institute did their top 100, uh, movies of all time back in 1998, this was originally number 98, so it just barely made the list, but then they did a revision of it in 2007, and it actually moved up 30 spots, and it's number, it was number 68 on that list, so... It's kind of weird for a movie to move up that many spots after yeah, more and more after movies. Yeah, after 10 years, yeah. yeah. had come out, but um, that was pretty cool. Um, oh, I, I just noticed this note. One of the last things that I really liked in this movie was kind of the contrast between English Bob and Will, because English Bob is... Will? Yeah. Will? Oh, Will. Will. Oh, William William Money. Money. Okay, I always called him Bill. Yeah, there's a little Bill, so I just say Will okay. to, like, distinct okay. between the two. Um... Like, English Bob is this cocky uh, guy who kind of glorifies himself, makes up stories to make himself look better. Um, but in the end, he's kind of a liar. Whereas Will is this old reserved guy who uh, does kind of the opposite. I remember at one point in the movie, the Schofield Kid is like, is that story I heard about you true when you were caught in this saloon and you were able to take out two guys uh, single-handedly? He goes, yeah, it was a different time. And then, like, minutes later, Ned looks at him and goes, you know, I remember it wasn't two guys that you took out in that saloon. It was three. So, like, his feats are actually better than what he portrays them as. So yeah, they're kind yeah. of, it's kind of the opposite of English Bob. Mm -hmm. So I, 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 sure. I, I kind of like that contrast there. 
Yeah, well, that's a good point. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, yeah, I don't Did you have any, before we get to scores, did you have any other thoughts, notes, or anything you wanted um, to bring up about this movie? No, not really. Um, you know, I kind of, I always try to think about things I like, things I didn't like. This is not even really a critique of the movie at all. Uh, I touched on this a little bit earlier. I just, it, it was just so sad for me, like, Ned's story arc in this one was just kind of a bummer. It's like he, you know, he ended up. Like, he just wanted to help a friend kind of thing. And once he realized, yeah, this isn't for me, that's when things really go downhill for him. So it's like, that that was a bummer for me. But like I said, not a critique of the movie. More more so just something that made me kind of sad. Yeah. So. <laughs> um, but yeah, um, in terms of score, I give this one an 8.5. Really solid movie. Good movie. Um, yeah, I think I've kind of made my case. I like that it's... A little bit different take on a Western. Um, you know, if someone said, hey, what what are some Westerns that I need to see? Like, what's a classic? I would for sure say, like, yeah, spend your time mm-hmm. watching this one. It's sure. just different. I feel like it's just different from other Westerns that it's definitely worth Well, it's just know, like there's, there's, there's more to the story there. Like, I, I think sometimes for me, Westerns don't always keep my attention. But I think because this is kind of a, a different storyline and maybe a different pace. Like, so there's not a ton of action until, like, the very end. Um, I think it just, it holds your attention differently. Mm Mm-hmm. Yep, I would give this movie, I'm going to give it a 9.6. I do, I really enjoy this movie. It's extremely rewatchable for me as well. Um, it's funny, it's emotional, there's some action. Some people would probably complain, like one of the critiques people might have on this movie is there isn't enough action, which I can, I could get, but like this movie is more than just action scenes. It's a... It's a little deeper than that, so that's, I guess, my what I would say in response to that. Um, but I do. I think this is a great movie and one that most that most people should try to see if you're a movie lover. Uh, it's funny. I think mo- people who love traditional westerns may not love this, but it's Clint. It's great. This is the last western he ever made, and he dedicated the films to his mentors, uh, Sergio L- uh, Leon and Don Siegel. They're the two directors he'd worked with on most of his westerns. So, uh, so that's pretty cool. Uh, so yeah, that's our that's our breakdown of uh, Unforgiven. Uh, check it out if you can. As far as I know, it isn't streaming anywhere. But um, you know, if if you can, you can always rent stuff on Amazon or stuff, you know, something like that. Okay, so we'll dive into real justice, which is, I think, something we're going to try to do a little more often, and, you know, we may tweak it along the way, but I really like diving into, you know, the the Academy Awards and the different years, and something I kind of want to introduce is debating between, like, what should have won Best Picture or not. Sometimes it'll be maybe easy, sometimes not, who knows. Um, So, yeah, for this, uh, for this episode, we'll do Unforgiven, which obviously won Best Picture, and then uh, versus the Crying Game, which uh, apparently when I looked at the odds for Best Picture for 1992, this was uh, second, or at least was up there, and it was streaming on Netflix, so it made it easy for us to watch, which uh, we'll be releasing that review uh, shortly after this one, so stay tuned for that. Uh, but yeah, we'll, you know, uh, first category we have is Cinematography. Uh, did you want to go first, or did you want me to go first? Uh, you can go first. Okay, so I think, you know, not to sway your vote or anything, but I think this one is fairly easy. Uh, cinematography I have is Unforgiven. I mean, it's a Western. It takes place in, uh, you know, they filmed in Canada, but obviously takes place on the Western front. So there's a lot more beautiful, gorgeous shots in it. There's a lot more landscape and things they had to work with to get this movie done, whereas, you know, with Crying Game, while it's still a good movie... You know, it's, you're in the streets of London and, you know, in, are they in Ireland for a little bit? I can't even remember. But it just didn't seem as impressive to me. So I'm going to go with Unforgiven on this one. Yeah, I'm going with Unforgiven on this one too. It's kind of hard to compare the two different, uh, just like scene, you're right, like the different scenes and uh, different locations they had for the two movies. So for me, yeah, Unforgiven hands down wins cinematography. Yeah, I think that was pretty Mm -hmm. clear-cut. So the next one is music or score, however you want to put it. 
Um, I know we were talking about this beforehand, this one. Neither of them have really anything that stands out to you. You know, it isn't like a Hans Zimmer score yeah. or anything like that. Um, but I was giving this one to Unforgiven because uh, when I heard the theme song at the beginning of the movie, I went, oh, that's right, I do remember this one. And I guess Crying Game does have a song, like the song, The Crying Game, that's associated with the movie. But also Clint uh, apparently did some of the score for Unforgiven. <laughs> so really? the fact that he did that, I'm just, I'm going to give him the edge in this one too. Hmm. Okay. Uh, yeah, that's impressive. I don't think I knew that. Um, yeah, this is a tough one for me because I, I mean, you mentioned that there's kind of like the main themes. Like I can't even think of what it is from Unforgiven. Um, but I feel like music plays a larger role in Crying Game just because part of it is like singers in a club. And yeah, the fact that the title of the film is based off a song that's sung in the movie. I think I'm going to go with Crying Game on this one. Okay. That's fair. You're right. It, I mean, it's, it's you close. Are, you are right that like music plays a more pivotal role in the movie, mm -hmm. which is yeah, an interesting just, like, take on it too. Music in general, so, yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's fair. Uh, moving on to writing, which this one I thought was actually kind of tricky to to pick between because they're that's, actually that's how I feel too. Yeah, yeah. I keep going back and forth between the two because they were both nominated for best original screenplay. Uh, the winner was actually Crying Game. Neil Jordan for Crying Game, um, but. You know, uh, when I look at the two movies, so Unforgiven is a different take on a Western, which is why I, I you know, I, I kind of wanted to want to pick it because it, it kind of took a genre that had been around forever and made it different, right? It took, put a different spin on it. So that, I mean, that's pretty tough to do. Um, sorry, I was just looking at the plot on Wikipedia. It was just up on my phone, and the first thing I saw was Quick Mike's small penis. That's funny. Um, <laughs> um, but Crying Game is, I mean, it's just a movie I'd, I'd never seen a movie like this before. Um, it, it involves IRA agents and from Ireland, a kidnapping, a bond between the kidnapper and the kidnappee. There's a twist in it that happens a little over halfway through the movie. Um, it deals with the type of relationship that really isn't brought up in movies that often. Uh, so I'm going to go with Crying Game. Because I, I, it won the Oscar for Best Screenplay over Unforgiven, which that isn't why I'm picking it, but I think it's a testament as to like the type of screenplay that it was. Yeah, um, I, I completely agree with all the points that you're bringing up with Crying Game, that it's... Um... Yeah, it, it brings in a lot of like different types of relationships and many relationships that we haven't seen that often or haven't been played out in the same way. Uh, for me, I feel like there's more impactful dialogue in Unforgiven. It does uh, have a lot of good lines. I mean, yeah, I brought up some lines exactly. earlier. Exactly. So this is a tough one here too, but I think I'm leaning towards Unforgiven on this. That's, I don't think, like I said, they're both nominated for, mm -hmm. for Best Original Screenplay, so I, I don't think you could go wrong with picking each one. It's each, either one is just however you interpret it, mm -hmm. so that's fair. Okay. Uh, okay, so I've got, what's the tally right now for you? Are all three Unforgiven? Or no, sorry, uh, two of them are Unforgiven, one for Crying Game. Yes. And same for me, just for different yep. different categories. <laughs> yep, okay. yep, two, one. <laughs> On to Acting. Uh, this one wasn't as tough of a choice for me. I think the acting is great in both of them. Yeah. Really, the only reason I'm going with Unforgiven is because there's more of it. Like, there's two, basically two main characters in Crying Game, in Fergus and Dill. Like, the two, you know, the, both of, both the actors that played those roles, uh, Stephen Ray and uh, Jay Davison, both got nominated for their roles. Um... Neither of them won. And, but then when I look at Unforgiven, I see, okay, Clint was nominated. And I'm not saying just because he's nominated, but Clint was great in his role and he was nominated. Gene Hackman was nominated for his role and he won. Morgan Freeman is great as usual. Richard Harris, not Ed Harris, uh, Richard Harris was good in his role. Even I'm sorry I ever brought that up because <laughs> the whole, I'm just like, Richard, not Ed, Harris. <laughs> uh, he was great in his role even though, you know, he wasn't in it as much. 
Um, there's just more of better acting in this one. So I'm going with Unforgiven for it, for this one. I'm also going with Unforgiven. It's just, you have that, like, caliber of people in this cast. It's, it's hard for me not to side with Unforgiven. But on the flip side, like, Jay Davidson, his role as Dill in, uh, Crying Game was phenomenal. Like, a really, really fascinating character. Really, um, just like, yeah, really good acting for someone who, I mean, Clint had been at this for his whole life, and this was kind of a new new role for this person. Mm-hmm. No, oh, yeah, for sure. We And we talked about Jay a little bit in our review, so make sure to tune into that after this one comes out. For sure. Because, yeah, he, uh, that role was Jay's first, mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. kind of accidentally and got it. So it was it, very well done. A little, yeah, very interesting. So yeah, alright, we both pick Unforgiven for that one. Uh, the last one, I think, it looks like Unforgiven won for both of us already, but uh, if there ever was a tiebreaker, I think our tiebreaker is just, which one did you enjoy more? <laughs> I think it just, ultimately the movie comes down to which one did you like more. Um, and for me, it's Unforgiven. I actually thought, and you know, I talked about it a little more in the, the, our breakdown of Crying Game. I thought Crying Game was a little boring it wasn't it wasn't as good as I thought it was gonna be and I could rewatch Unforgiven all day long and I still love it so I that would have been my tiebreaker anyways yeah uh Unforgiven is yeah something I would be more well I mean we have seen this multiple times now because the first time we went through this um I may or may not have fallen asleep so shocker (laughs) so when we were getting ready to do the podcast I said Let's watch this again. One, because I know I didn't catch everything. But two, like, it seemed like it was on the right track. So it's like, I, I, I want to see it again and, like, appreciate it. And it was. It was just, it was really good. Um, like I said, I mean, Crying Games is available on Netflix. So go check it out if you're interested. But um, if I had to recommend one over the other, I would say Unforgiven. Yeah. All right. There we go. Academy made the right call with Unforgiven, in our opinion. Good job. So there we go. Yep. Good job, Academy. <laughs> Um, all right, so on that note with the Academy, let's dive into the rest of the winners and nominees of the 1992 films. So the Academy Awards, the 1993 Academy Awards, but the films of 92. Uh, we don't usually do screenplay, but I figured include it in at least this year because there are some, some big hitters there. So what... Why don't you uh, lead us off and read off the winners and nominees for adapted screenplay? Here's an aside. Because I know some of these, it looks like you've added some in. Oh, is that right? Yeah, yeah. It's like, are the things in yellow, like the ones that you've added in? Is yeah. Is that right? Yeah. I just want to make I'm, sure I didn't read I them mean, off. No, you're, you're good. I, I should stop copy and pasting my edited one in there. <laughs> it's okay. I thought I, I thought I didn't this time, but clearly I did. Okay, yeah, so we can go ahead and jump into the screenplays. Um, Let's see, for adapted screenplay, I'm not going to go through everyone's names because some of these movies have like three, four people on them. I'm just going to say the film. (laughs) Plus some of these names are hard to pronounce, so I'm just... We're going just with the title of the movie. Okay. 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 How's that sound? Is okay. that okay? Yeah. All right. Adapted screenplay. We've got Enchanted April, The Player, A River Runs Through It, Scent of a Woman, and then the winner for Adapted Screenplay uh, for 1992 was Howard's End. Yeah. And you've seen a number of these, right? Yes. Yeah. So I was going to say, everyone better appreciate this. I'm putting a pat on my back. Uh, I watched a lot of movies to get ready for for this one because I'd really only seen a couple and I'm like there's too many big movies here I need to watch them so I watched we rewatched Unforgiven we watched The Crying Game I watched Howard Howard's Ends on Netflix I watched The Player uh, which is on the Criterion Channel uh, app if people want to watch that I've seen Scent of a Woman River Runs Through It what else did I rewatch I watched one other one I'm pretty sure. To get ready for this. Anyways, I watched a lot of movies, and people should be <laughs> proud of me for that. Um, I don't love taking away nominations for movies I haven't seen. 
Uh, I and right after I say that, that usually means I'm about to do it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, because I need to get David Mamet's Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross in here as a nomination. I have no idea how that didn't get nominated. It's absolutely ridiculous. It's considered one of the best screenplays of all time. It didn't even get nominated. It's ridiculous. Uh, so I'm going to take out Enchanted April because that's the only movie on this list that I haven't seen. I have never even heard of it. I have no idea what it is. It's based on a novel, apparently. Um, so I'm taking that nomination away. And I did enjoy Howard Zen, but I'm taking that win away. And I'm going to give the player the win. Okay. Can you give us like a quick like two-second rundown of like, what's, what is Howard's End about versus what is the player about? Howard's End is about... It's like a Victorian-ish era film. It's about a family in that lives in London that they have this house out in the country. It's like their vacation house and it's called Howard's End. Um, the wife or the mother of that family is dying. She befriends Emma Thompson's character before she dies. And then after she dies, Emma Thompson marries her former husband, Anthony Hopkins. And in her will, she left Howard's End to Emma Thompson, but Anthony Hopkins doesn't want to give it to her, so he never tells anyone. He doesn't tell her that. So it's, that's the basic premise. And, you know, there's more that happens after that, but that's what it is. And the player is uh, about a Hollywood executive, of a, or a studio executive in Hollywood, who is getting threatening messages and postcards in the mail from apparently a writer that he had turned down for a movie. Uh, so, you know, that's bas the basic premise of that. So I would give the win to the player. Uh, we'll, we'll talk about the player a little bit. Well, both of these movies a little bit later. But those are the changes I'll ma I would make for adapted screenplay. Okay. There, I mean, there's some other big hit. I love A River Runs Through It. Uh, I think Scent of a Woman is pretty good. But, yeah, I got to get Gl Glenn Gary, G Glenn Ross in there. So. Okay. Um, moving to original screenplay, uh, we've talked through a few of these already, um, but we have nominations for Husbands and Wives, which is a Woody Allen screenplay, uh, Lorenzo's Oil, Passion Fish, Unforgiven, which I already mentioned, and then the winner, like you said, was uh, Crying Game. Yep, so, you know, Husbands and Wives, I haven't seen it, it's written by Woody Allen, I feel like he just gets nominations based on his name alone, because he's considered one of the best screenwriters of all time. Uh, George Miller, you know, Mad Max is George Miller getting a nomination for Lorenzo's ha Oil. You mean ha Happy Feet's George ba Miller? Babe's George <laughs> Miller. Um, I have seen Lorenzo's I don't, Oil. I don't know how that guy writes those stories. He's amazing. Stories. He's amazing. Well-rounded uh, person. I've seen Lorenzo's Oil, and I think that movie is phenomenal, and I think the writing is really good in it, too, so that one's really good. i never seen Passion Fish. I can't really speak to that at all, and we've discussed Unforgiven already at length, so there are three screenplays in this that I think are really good. The Crying Game, Lorenzo's Oil, and Unforgiven. I think the Academy got it right and sticking with uh, The Crying Game. Beautiful. Uh, should we get a supporting actor? Does that yeah. sound good? Sure. All right, so um, we've got Jay Davidson for The Crying Game, as we mentioned, uh, Jack Nicholson for A Few Good Men, uh, Al Pacino's role in Glengarry Glen Ross, and David Paymer for Mr. Saturday Night. The winner, like we mentioned, is Gene Hackman for his role as Sheriff Little Bill in Unforgiven. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it was a pretty strong category for this yeah. year. Uh, Jay Davidson was great. We discussed it a little bit more, uh, you know, again in, in our our review of it, which will be after this one, so check that out. Jack Nicholson's great. Few Good Men. I mean, he's got one of the most memorable lines <laughs> in movie history. Yeah, where does that stack up on the AFI list, I wonder? Right, for quotes or <laughs> yeah, something? Quotes, yeah, exactly. I don't know if it's on there or not, but yeah, you can't handle the truth. I mean, classic. Jack's great in that role. Um... Al Pacino getting a dual nomination because he, you know, we'll talk about it later, but he, he got a nomination one in Best Actor, but also got a nomination for Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross. David Paymer, uh, all time actor, veteran actor. This is his only nomination uh, for a, a Billy Crystal movie where he plays the brother slash manager of Billy Crystal's character, who's a comedian. Um, there are a couple changes I would make here. I would actually take Al Pacino out. 
you got the dual nomination. I kind of prefer spreading the wealth around a little bit. And, you know, he's good in Glengarry, Glen Ross, but that's like an ensemble cast. Uh, he's good in it, but, you know, I think he wasn't any... He wasn't... He was, wasn't, like, any better than a lot of the other characters in it, I guess is what I'm trying to say. Plus, since he already had a different nomination, I would take him out. And I would show some love to his co-star... In the other movie that he was nominated for, Incent of a Woman, in Chris O'Donnell. Rob, Batman and Robin's own uh, Chris <laughs> O'Donnell. You know, this was a younger him. Uh, he was great in the role. I mean, he pretty much shared screen time with Al Pacino and was ex very good in that role. So I would give him a nomination. Uh, as far as the winner goes, I would keep it as Gene Hackman. I think he was fantastic in that, you know villainish role of the sheriff uh little bill yeah and for me i mean i i have seen most of these movies and for me i the the more i process it the more impressed i am with jay davidson role so i might actually switch that, them out is that a change you would make yeah. okay that's yeah. fair um anyway uh again to supporting actress this is like one of my all-time favorite wins so <laughs> So I kind of did this one in a different order. I'm like, I want to sa savor this one a little bit. Oh, okay. So we have nominations for Judy Davis in Husbands and Wives, Joan Plowright in Enchanted April, Vanessa Redgrave in Howard's End, Miranda Richardson in Damage, and the winner is Marissa Tomei as Mona Lisa Beto from My Cousin Vinny, <laughs> which has to be one of like the most amazing like wins yeah. in Oscar history. Yeah, it was... Definitely, like, consider one of the most shocking moments. Mm -hmm. uh, the favorite was Judy Davis from Husbands and Wives. That was the favorite going into it. There was actually a pretty, probably not great rumor going around because, um, so they, they did for the longest time, like, the opposite sex winner of the same category, like, the previous year presented. So the year before, Jack Palance had won Best Supporting Actor for City Slickers. Mm -hmm. So he handed out this award. Mm -hmm. And... He's on the older side, so a lot of people thought he misspoke or misread the winner, and it sh wasn't actually Marissa Tomei. So he was the me. Warren Beatty before. Yeah, but I think, <laughs> but what I, think I mean, that was just a rumor. I don't think there's any way that that's true, because as Warren Beatty and like the whole Moonlight, La La Land situation showed us, that if the announcer gets it wrong, they're going to fix it. Yes, yes, exactly. So she won, deservedly so. Everyone um, needs to see that movie, by the way. I feel like it's on TV all the time. Yeah, that's like a please, classic AMC. Please sit down and watch that movie. It is so entertaining. Yes. That, yeah. And she won it because of like her scene at the end in the courtroom. It's just so good. So, so good. Yep. Uh, so, yeah, look Her name at, is Mona Lisa. Mona Lisa Vito. Yep. It's so she's, good. Can you tell she's Italian? It's so good. I love it. Um... So there's some change. There's really only one change I would make to this, and so since I've seen Howard's End now, Vanessa Redgrave plays that the wife that ends up dying in it mm -hmm. pretty early on in that movie. She, I don't think she really has enough screen time for me to give her a nomination here and okay. choose anything crazy. But to keep it in that movie of someone I would give a nomination for, Helen Bonham Carter was really good in that movie. Uh, so I would give. I would take Vanessa Redgrave out and give her the nomination instead. Uh, but then, yeah, I would keep Marissa Tomei as the winner because I love that she won an Oscar for that movie. Yeah, so fantastic. Aunt May. Yeah, Aunt May in the new Spider-Man. The, the current Aunt May. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, perfect. I'll jump into Best Actress. Uh, this year we had Catherine uh, Denview nominated for Indochine. I don't even, I've, never, I've never heard of her. I've never heard of that movie. That's my, that's my take. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> Moving on. Mary McDonald for Passion Fish, Michelle Pfeiffer for Love Field, Susan Sarandon for Lorenzo's Oil, and the winner was Emma Thompson from Howard's End. Mm-hmm. And actually, some I forgot to mention, you said in Supporting Actress, Miranda yeah. Richardson, she's actually in Crying Game. She's the IRA agent who's, like, in love with Fergus at the beginning, mm -hmm. and you think she's dead, and then she shows up at the end. Gotcha. So, pretty okay. good year for her. She got an yeah. Oscar nomination and was in, you know, The Crying Game as well. Big time Oscar-nominated and winning movie in that year. So. Yeah. Uh, but, yeah, Best Actress. Uh, okay, uh, the name that you said 
and, and I'm, I'm not going to try to pronounce, I haven't seen, uh, I haven't seen Patrick's finish or Mary McDonald. She was, she was, you know, she was her, her second nomination. She was, she was nominated to Dance Hall before, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, Michelle, Michelle Pfeiffer is great, uh, 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 you know, because I hadn't seen it, so I was excited to watch it. Watch it. I wasn't too sure, sure about this, because she, she didn't even the tell, but like, I don't know, I'm going to be in much screen time. She had she had she had one best actress, or the seat, seat. She's great, she's great. great. And, uh, and uh, uh, she has multiple emotions and things that happen in this movie. And when I looked into it, she basically swept, like, every award for best actress this year. So, I mean, I think she deserved it for this year. So, nothing I would really change in this category. Awesome. What kind of best actress? Actor, we had a nomination for Robert Downey Jr. in Chaplin, Clint Eastwood in Unforgiven, Stephen Ray in The Crying Game, and Denzel Washington in Malcolm X. The winner, uh, we've already mentioned him here, is Al Pacino for Scent of a Woman. Yeah, so Best Actor, this is this is a tricky one in a sense because there's a lot of people who are left off, not a lot, but some people that were left off of nom- nomination here, like Joe Pesci for My Cousin Vinny, or Daniel Day-Lewis for The Last of the Mohicans. Mm, mm-hmm. um, but I'm going to leave the nominations the same, because I love Joe Pesci in that movie, but when I look at these other nominees, I mean, I haven't seen Chaplin, but Robert Downey Jr. as Chaplin, from the clips I've seen, like he's just embodied him and became Charlie Chaplin in that movie. Uh, Clint Eastwood... I mean, we've discussed it already. He's great as William Money, and this was his first acting nomination ever in his career, and I think he deserved it. Stephen Ray in The Crying Game is is pretty good. This is one where maybe I could take him out and plug someone else in, but this is Stephen Ray's only nomination, uh, and I always like spreading the wall, so I think I'll keep him in there as Fergus. Uh, The change I would make, and this is kind of hurts, because this is El Pacino's only Oscar win. I mean, he's like considered one of the best actors of all time. He is one of the best actors of all time, if it's not the best. It's his birthday today. Oh yeah, they were recording. We're recording. Yep, happy 80th birthday. <laughs> um, <laughs> it, it's tough for me to take the win away from him, but this is not his best role. I think people would accept that. Mm-hmm. I think this is more of like a lifetime achievement. Yeah, I you mean, know, like, if if you had told me that the only role he won Best Actor for was Scent of a Woman, I'd be like, really? Yeah, I mean, you like got a, The Godfather, he's, he's one, two, and three, and better roles than that. Serpico, Dog Day Afternoon. I mean, he's so many classic roles, but this is the one. This is similar to Paul Newman when he won for <laughs> his only Oscar for The Color of Money instead of like any other number of uh, characters that he's played. So it hurts me to say this, but I, I think the actual best actor from this year was Denzel and Malcolm X. He was, I mean, I know you haven't seen that movie. It's a Spike Lee movie. I, we actually own it. And that's it. really all you need to tell me, a Spike Lee movie about Malcolm X starring Denzel Washington. Yeah. Like, yeah, I'm buying into that. It's, it, and it just covers so much time, too. It's like him when he was, like, Malcolm X, like, pre-activist and everything, when he mm-hmm. was, like, a pimp. You know, and then it all the way to the end of his life is like when this movie takes place, and Denzel is so good in this role that I I want and, and Al Pacino to be an Oscar winner, and he deserves to be one. And I know Denzel would go on to win two Oscars, you know, throughout his career. So I would be I'm okay with either Al or Denzel winning an Oscar here, but I I would probably lean towards Denzel. Yeah. And it, you know, historically the Academy tends to reward people doing, you know, real life characters. Yeah. You know. They do, and I don't know if that's right or wrong. I don't mm-hmm. always love that. I like having like an original character win. Right. Um but, but maybe yeah, I mean, it's... that could go to some surprise as to why Denzel yeah. didn't win. But yeah, again, that's kind of what I'm getting at. But I think, again, it's because it's Al Pacino. It's a lifetime achievement win kind of thing. So mm-hmm. yeah. Denzel had won an Oscar like th- three years earlier for Glory. So. Oh, okay. I love that movie. Yeah. Good movie. Um, okay, moving to Best Director, we have Neil Jordan for The Crying Game. So he wrote and directed that. Yeah. Nice. Okay. Uh, James Ivory for Howard's End. 
Robert Altman for The Player, Martin Brest for Scent of a Woman, and then Clint Eastwood won for Unforgiven. Yeah, so this this is basic, this is the category. This is the reason I watch all these movies because I looked at this category. I'm like, there's like two people that I would want to get into this category, <laughs> which means I got to take two out. Yeah. And I didn't want to take out people that I hadn't I hadn't seen the movie, especially for this category. Um, the two that I want to get in are Rob Reiner for A Few Good Men. Okay. I, this yeah. Is usually, yeah. I think. You know, When Harry Met Sally is another great movie it is, <laughs> but I think of this for Rob Reiner. Yeah. And then uh, Robert Redford for A River Runs Through mm, It. Yeah. Yeah, those those would be two good ones to get in there. But that means I had to take two out, uh, and I, I was like, Robert Altman, the player? I've never even heard of that movie. And then I finally watched it, I'm like, okay, there are parts of this movie that I didn't love, but overall this was a pretty good movie. So I'm going to keep Robert Altman in there. James Ivory for Howard Zen. I mean, uh, James Ivory, he would go on to win an Oscar finally. He wrote um, uh, Call Me By Your Name. Oh, okay. But uh, his direction was good in this, too. I, the easy one for me was to take out Michael Brest for Scent of a Woman. Like, I like Scent of a Woman, but I think that movie is somewhat overrated. It got a ton of love at the, the Academy this year, but not for the category I wanted, like Best Supporting Actor. But I, I think the movie is slightly overrated. So I would take him out. And unfortunately, that means I'm going to take out Neil Jordan. He won an Oscar for writing. And I, I, I agree with that decision. So he got his Oscar. And while I think it's amazing that he got the movie made because it was, barely had a budget, um, I would still take him out and put both Robs in, Redford and Reiner. But then as far as the winner goes, I agree that it should be Clint Eastwood. So I'm keeping that the same. Okay. Did you have any different thoughts on that i don't think you've seen no. all these movies but. no i haven't but um yeah i i agree with your your takes it, it's hard not to get rob reiner and Robert redford in in there mm -hmm. so um but yeah looking at best picture nominees that year uh we've mentioned all of these a few times here crying game a few good men howard's end scent of a woman and unforgiven yeah, so Best Picture, this would have been a good time for them to have it expanded for, like, up to 10. Yeah, <laughs> sure. Mm -hmm. um, but that's what makes us tough because, so I've seen all these movies, but some other movies that weren't nominated for Best Picture that came on the same year are Lorenzo Zoyle, which has been brought up before already. League of Their Own came out this year, oh which gosh. is a good movie. Mm -hmm. uh, Reservoir Dogs, Quentin Tarantino's first movie. Which I guess you could argue maybe original screenplay he could have been put yeah, in there. Yeah. So yeah, you know what? Take out friggin' Passion Fish or whatever that <laughs> is, and I'll put in put in QT for Reservoir Dogs. A little late adjustment for original screenplay there. Um, but that 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 came out this year. White Men Can't Jump came out in 1992. That I mean, you might laugh at it, but that that's a great movie. Um, Aladdin. I mean, just the year before, Disney got a Best Picture nomination for Beauty and the Beast. Oh, okay. So, you know, Aladdin, you could have maybe made an argument for it. And then I mentioned this movie already, but Last of the Mohicans. I mean, classic movie. You know, these are all great movies that came out in 1992. But really, the only change I would make here is, I kind of hinted at it, I think Scent of a Woman is overrated. I would take out Scent of a Woman, and I would put in a movie that I can't believe this didn't get... Uh, nominated for Best Picture. I already gave him uh, the Best Actor Oscar for his role in this movie, but Malcolm X. I don't know if Malcolm X didn't get a Best Best Picture nomination this year. So I would take out Scent of a Woman and put in Malcolm X and then keep Unforgiven as the winner. It's going back kind of a half second since we're talking about Malcolm X, did you have any consideration of uh, getting Spike Lee in? For Best Director? Yeah. I did... It's like I said, there were already two people yeah. I wanted to get in there. Like yeah. this is a great year for directing. Um, I mean, if if I really want to make the push, I would still keep Robert Altman in there, and then maybe take James Ivory out and put in Spike Lee. So like, I would maybe make that change because you're right. Like, I mean, he was. And I I'm just going on like I say I haven't seen the movie, but I'm just kind of going off the fact that Spike Lee's a fantastic director. Yeah, he didn't and get. I feel he like didn't he, get he doesn't his, get enough love. No, you're right. That's a good point because he didn't get his first best director nomination until Black Klansman. That's so sad. Yeah. <laughs> That's so disappointing. That's ridiculous to me. 
So you're right. Like maybe there could be an argument. There could very much be an argument made to get Spike Lee a nomination here. I think that's a packed category. This for this. Yeah, year. like there are some in the early '90s or since or since the '90s that are kind of easy. Like oh, okay, keep this the same. Don't change it. And then there's some where I'm like I'm fighting to get maybe three people into a category, yeah. which means you got to take three people out. Um. So yeah, yeah. Maybe take James Ivory out. No offense to him. I mean, I liked Howard's then. I didn't love it. So yeah, you could easily. In my opinion, you know, take him out and put in Spike Lee. Sure. All right. Any other thoughts for the um, Academy Awards for the 1992 films? The 65th. The 65th Academy Awards <sighs> ceremony. No, I think I spoke my mind on it. I think, uh, I mean, no, that was Robert Downey Jr.'s first nomination. He only has two in his career. The other one being <laughs> Tropic Thunder. <laughs> Playing oh a, a white Australian dude playing a black man. Oh my god. That <laughs> <laughs> just like blows my mind. Yep. Crazy. <laughs> oh, beautiful. Alright, All right, so, so we'll uh, episode, episode 20, 20 do a quick update on our rankings for the best picture, picture winners so far. How'd you do this? Did you want to zoom through like some of these, like just list off number twenty to like fit like six or something, and then we'll. How did you want to do it? Sure. Yeah. Okay. Or let's let's do twenty twenty through eleven. Okay. And then we can do like ten through six, and we can go back and forth for five through one. Does that work? Yeah. Okay. You want to go break break it up a little. Yeah, you want to give go people some time to to keep track. To process. <laughs> yeah, process. All right. Did you want to go first, twenty to eleven? Yes, I can do that. Um. Okay, twentieth. I've got the greatest show on earth. Nineteen. I've got platoon. Eighteen. Chariots of fire. Seventeen. Bridge on the river Kwai. Sixteen is Braveheart. 15, I have A Beautiful Mind, 14, American Beauty, 13, In the Heat of the Night, 12, new one to add into the list here, One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, and then number 11, I have Ben-Hur. Number 11, Ben-Hur, okay. Makes me kind of sad, that one just keeps, it, it, it trickles down <laughs> a little bit, it's tough. Yeah, no, it is, like, I mean, they're all best picture winners so in theory yeah. they're all good so it's tough like where are they stacking up yeah, and everything? yeah exactly all right let me bj's clean shave and i don't like it yeah it's kind of weird right it's so weird it makes his nose look bigger <laughs> It makes his nose look weird. It doesn't. It just That's it funny. looked weird there, so I just had a comment. That's funny. Okay. Bubba and Jordan went toe to toe in the twenty fourteen. Yeah. I didn't think. So I'm like, yep. That's why I was confused as to what year this was. I'm like, but I thought Speed beat out Bubba, but that was he lost. Bubba yeah, before. he did. All right. <laughs> uh, so for me. Number 20 is Great Show on Earth. We got the same one there. Yep. 19 is Chariots of Fire. 18, American Beauty. 17, Shakespeare in Love. Oh, boo! <laughs> Calm down. 16 is No Country for Old Men. 15, A Beautiful Mind. 14, A Bridge on River Kwai. 13, Dances with Wolves. 12, Braveheart. And number, number 11, question mark? <laughs> question mark? And number 11, Rain Man. Nice. My 10 through 6, I have Rain Man. So, more thought to than you. Mm -hmm. uh, no Country for Old Men. I've got This Week's Unforgiven at number 8. Gladiator at 7. And Shakespeare in Love at six. Mm. So those are three three new editions. We've reviewed Rain Man on Forgiving Gladiator since. So I've got those in my eleven through six group. All right. Number ten for me is Platoon. Number nine is Ben Hur. Eight, One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. 
seven in the heat of the night. And number six is the departed. The departed. <laughs> I knew one of us would do the accent. <laughs> How can you not? Yeah. <laughs> I feel like every time we talk about that movie, I have to. Do yeah. <laughs> oh my good. All right, we're going back and forth for a five for yeah. ones, right? Sure. My number five, I have the Deer Hunter. Yep. So do I. Ah, uh, nice. Yeah. It's just uh, I want to sit down and watch that again. I'm still surprised you like that movie so much. <laughs> I was too. Maybe maybe I went into it with low expectations. I'm like, ah, oh, another war movie. Oh my god. I did. I really liked it. So it's a different, it's kind of like Unforgiven. It's a different take on a war movie. It's not all combat the whole time. No, yeah, it's not. There's very there, there are other there. aspects of it that mm-hmm. are interesting. Okay. Uh, number four, I have Schindler's List. Yeah, so do I. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> Here, okay, three is wrong. I know we will differ on these because you've said some of these already. So uh, three, I have The Sting. Yeah, I don't. That has not been on my list yet, so that is not number three for me. My number three is Unforgiven. Nice. All right. Uh, number two. I that's where I have the departed. Oh. Okay. I didn't realize you hadn't said that one yet. Yeah. Very high. Nice. Yeah. It's just. It, it, it's weird because like watching it again, I'm like, <laughs> there's like a lot of nasty shit that goes down this movie, and I've said this like when you're watching The Sopranos, I'm like. Why are there so many movies and TV shows made about like gangsters and like that like mob shit? Like it's really not that fascinating. But for it's me, very fascinating. For me, The Departed is just really good. No, it's, I think it's very fascinating. The, the ending just like pays off. So oh, it's just like where everyone dies. Everyone dies. Just like holy shit! You invest all that time into these people, and then they're just all dead. Mm. Okay, all right. God, Marty is Oscar, so I can't complain. So my two is the departed. Yep. My number two is the sting. Yep. Uh, I do. I get that it's kind of hard to follow. <laughs> Even the actors while making the movie had no idea what the fuck the plot of that movie was. But I, I don't know if you've seen it so many times. That I know what the plot is, and it's just it's fun at the same time. It is. It's funny. It's, and it's really fun. fun. It's yeah. a really fun movie. So I just one of the great intros to a character with Henry Gondor for he's just. He's, the bed is empty, but you can hear someone snoring. He's just his nose is pressed up against the wall. He's fell in between the wall and the bed. So, so good. That's my number two. Beautiful. So, do you know what my number one is? I will be honest. I was not paying attention as you're rattling them off. That's <laughs> fine. My number one is Dance with the Wolves. Oh, uh, I guess I could have guessed that. So yeah. <laughs> it was number one last time. Yes. <laughs> Good fellows, show one this picture that you hear another gangster movie. So, <laughs> my number one is Gladiator. Yep. Even though that movie is like two and a half hours long, it's still very rewatchable for me. It's got some all time great lines in it, great action. I like the story too. I like redemption arcs in movies, and this is a big one. I mean, the, the whole movie is like in three sentences. The, General that became a slave, slave that became a gladiator, gladiator that defied an emperor, like ultimate redemption arc. Surprisingly emotional too. If people, if you just say the title gladiator and what it's about, surprisingly emotional. Like, you know, a little tear jerky at the end of it. So that's my number one. Wonderful. Mm-hmm. Nice. So what? Uh, Unforgiven was the highest out of the last five that we put in for you. Is that right? Uh, yeah, you mean the five most recent ones? Yeah, our five most recent that we added in. Oh, uh, well, Gladiator was like, was episode 17. Oh, yeah, you're right. Okay, never mind. Okay. So, so no. no. Just <laughs> incorrect. What you said is incorrect. When you edit this, can you just take that out? Make me sound no, smarter. No, make it louder <laughs> for everyone to hear. It's late. I'm tired. <laughs> All right, so there's our top 20 for our 20 Best Picture winners. Mm-hmm. What um, what Best Picture winner are we um, reviewing next episode? The French Connection. The French Connection, another Gene Hackman movie. Yep, well, his two Oscars back-to-back, winning for Unforgiven and then winning for The French Connection. No, I thought he meant winning back-to-back years. I'm like, no. 
No, no, those, no, no those movies are 20 years apart from each other. So I'm like, what are you talking about? But in these two movies, you won in both of them. Yes. Back-to-back episodes for us, not back-to-back It's episodes. about us. I don't give a shit about real lifetime. I care about us. Back-to-back for us. <laughs> All right, awesome. So next next episode, French Connection. Stay tuned for our quarantine streaming movie reviews, including the one for The Crying Game. And anything else you wanted to add for this episode? Nope. Boats and hoes. Okay. There. I added (laughs) something. I did what you wanted. It's funny, because as I said episode, I was like, oh, that sounded really, like, Wisconsin, really Midwestern of me, and then you just go with boats and hoes. (laughs) So there we go. Nice little Midwestern sign off Mm -hmm. for all the listeners. (laughs) See you next week. (laughs)